Well, good morning, Power Metrics Nation. I'm getting a little bit of an echo here, but it'll be. Yeah. Try it now. Cool. We're good now? I believe so. Okay. Let us know in the chat if it's not, because I'm sure. I've heard there was issues at the Golden Globes. We don't want that. So, uh, <laughs> so um, well, good morning, uh, Power Metrics Nation. Um, as if you've seen on other webinars and things, uh, I'm, uh, I'm John Jones, and um, I, uh, I don't have the wig these days, so I've, I've uh, got rid of the wig. Um, so uh, we're, uh, we've, we've started a new uh, little series here where we're going to invite our partners through our, uh, our reps around the world, and uh, we're going to uh, have them do uh, presentations on our platform. We're pretty excited about it. Um, all of these are going to be connected in the metering industry. Um, so um, we've already got several of them that have joined in and several more that are going to join in. So we're pretty excited. You'll get to see other products that you have to deal with every day out there. You'll get to see the innovations, what uh, the industry is moving towards. Um, it's not going to be sales pitches. It's going to be just telling us an informative, as we've done in the past, some, uh, some training. But also, really, you're just going to get to see what's going on with the other products in the industry. Um, so we're excited about that. And uh, this is the first of these this morning. I'll introduce the gentleman here in a little bit uh, who's going to be our first presenter. And, um, but as you know, if you've uh, seen me in the past, um, you know that I'm going to start this thing out with a quick prayer, and then we'll get rolling. So if you don't mind joining me here for a second, I'm going to go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for this time this morning. Um, we appreciate the guests that you have uh, joining us for the next several weeks. We appreciate them. And uh, Father, in the midst of everything that's going on in our country right now, it's hard for us to, uh, to imagine um, that uh, you're a father of love and that you love us so much. And uh, we look at the things you've done because uh, we're seeing a lot more hate in this world right now than we are love. So Father, I hope that we, uh, we turn to that and we turn to, uh, we turn to uh, the appreciation of the love uh, that you give us, uh, especially what you did with your son. And without him, we couldn't even uh, pray to you. So uh, I appreciate what your son did so much, appreciate the sacrifice that he made, and uh, Father, in the midst of all this, let us be lights of love to others, and let us show uh, that we love both our friends and our enemies, as you tell us in your word. So, uh, Father, in the midst of everything that's going on right now, just uh, thank you so much, and we appreciate so much what you've done for us, and uh, hopefully this country will turn more to you. So, all of these things I ask and say, according to the will of the one who paid it all, my brother, Jesus Christ. Amen. Cool. So, um, so we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Um, we, uh, as I said, we've got a, a guest this morning. We're excited to hear what he's got to tell us. I'll go through the normal, uh, uh, you know, we do our housekeeping every morning. So today, as you can see, we've got uh, Terry Chandler from Power Quality Inc. And I'll be talking a little bit more about him, introducing him here in a minute. Um, on the 9th, we've got Nate Dunn from Schneider Electric and Joe Childs with Electrical Resources. Um, Joe and Nate work uh, really closely together, and uh, Joe actually has done some programming stuff for them, so he's one of their top tier uh, reps, but also he works closely with Schneider directly. So we're going to see uh, what's going on with uh, metering uh, from the Schneider folks. Uh, then we've got on the 16th, we've got uh, Nick Candler with, uh, with Durham Company, and he's going to talk to us about uh, what's going on with Durham and the changes they've made. And also in the midst of all this, so we're going to talk a little bit about it, it can't help but come up changes and things that we've made adjustments because of COVID and what's going on with that. And then March 23rd, we're, uh, it's spring break, so we're going to take a little break. Uh, JP's taking a little break, and if JP's not here, I'm not here. If I don't have JP with me, I'm not doing it. So, uh, so uh, JP's going to take a little break, and then we'll go back into this series again with some of our other uh, manufacturing partners, uh, the reps that we have, and we're going to go through some other stuff. And I just wanted to mention, if you wanted to go ahead and register for that March 9th presentation, that's next week. There is a register now button just below the player. So if you'll scroll down just a little bit, you'll see a brief introduction and a register now button. Go ahead and get registered. If you register now, I know that I've had a lot of people get on to me about how many emails I send out. If you register now, you won't get a single email. Ah, uh -huh. and there's the carrot. So you won't get bugged by JP. <laughs> so thanks, JP. So if you'll go ahead and register now, you won't get the, uh, the emails from me because otherwise he is going to email you, I'm telling you. Because guess what? In case y'all don't realize this, little sidebar, I look up and I've got hundreds of emails every day. When it first started and I got behind because I was out on the road and then came in here to do the, <laughs> the webinars, I was like, 
what is going on? It's because it goes out under my name, so I get all the replies. I get all the automatic replies and the replies back from everybody, even some juicy comments, but all of that comes back to me. So I see how much he emails. He does a lot of emailing. He does a superb job with that. So if you don't want to get emailed by him, go ahead and register early. And today we have Terry Chandler. And uh, Terry is, as you can see, he's the power quality practitioner for over 35 years. Hello. So it's not his first rodeo. Um, he is found, founder and director of engineering for Power Quality Inc. USA and Power Quality Thailand. So um, if we'll pull Terry in now, I'll just chat with him for just a second and then I'll just turn him loose. So you on, Terry? Uh, I think so. Can you hear me now? Go ahead, Terry. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can hear you now, Terry. Um, I was just going to say, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, Terry, we were chatting a little bit uh, this morning, but you're in, uh, over in Thailand, you're in 35 different countries, is that what you said? Oh, no, eight, 18 different countries, we have 35 distributors uh, 35 around distributors. those 18 countries. Gotcha, so 18 countries, 35 distributors. Yeah, short-term memory is not that good anymore. But, uh, <laughs> I think so. So, uh, but you've been, uh, obviously you've been in Thailand forever and your office in Thailand's in Bangkok, but you're coming to us from Yuma, Arizona today, right? Uh, that's right, I'm at Power Quality Inc. in Yuma, Arizona right now. Nice, okay. And that, that hit, hit the chord with uh, JP because JP has lived out that way and they were even talking about particular coffee shops they had both been to. So, so JP was getting a little jealous of the freestanding coffee shops. They talked about that this morning. So um, actually, uh, where, where JP was located is the diagonally opposite corner of the state from where I'm located. I'm about 15 miles from Mexico and about eight miles from California. Gotcha. And uh, so, uh, so obviously, this is not your first rodeo, as I said earlier. So I'm going to turn the uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Terry. And we really appreciate you doing this. I, I wanted to thank you again for doing this doing this this morning, and uh, thank you so much. And with that much experience, we're sure to get some good stuff this morning. So thanks again, and the floor is yours, sir. Okay. Thank you, Jared. Yes, sir. Um, I guess everybody can hear me, so I'm going to proceed unless uh, we uh, we get some interruption. So um, the uh, the first thing I want to point out in this discussion, we're pretty much focused on three phase consumers as opposed to uh, residential metering, uh, both. Uh, because it's it's it leads the technology and uh, it covers a much broader range of parameters uh, we're going to have a little brief history of uh, electrical uh, revenue metering i did a little research and i found it very interesting uh, the history then we'll do a little history on power quality metering uh, i essentially got involved in the power quality world uh, at the very early early days, uh, one of my first engineering experiences was with a power quality problem, which got me started. Um, uh, we're going to talk about evolving uh, technology and uh, revolutionary technology. Uh, and I think that that's important because it will give you some feel for changes that come up in the market uh, and uh, how they impact uh, business, how they impact technology, how they impact yourself and your customers. Uh, the uh, a little view of metering and market technology in 2020, and uh, then at the uh, and both from the revenue meter side and from the quality of supply side. Uh, so uh, we'll talk some more about that. And then what's next, and why do I think it's what's coming? Uh, I guess uh, you learn, you predict the future from the past, and so we'll be able to give you something of what's going to happen in the future. So, uh, using our, our favorite research tool, uh, we found out that the, uh, the actually pretty much the first uh, meter was invented in 1872, and um, by a British engineer, and he labeled it as a lamp hour meter. And the reason it was labeled that is because the first application for electricity was street lamps. Uh, most people would have guessed that Edison designed the first uh, revenue meter, but actually uh, he was uh, a few years later, almost 10 years later. And uh, interesting thing is his uh, meter uh, was billing the customer as a cubic meter of gas. 
Hmm. And the reason for that was that because the lamps were uh, primarily uh, gas powered in that, at that time period. Uh, I think what's even more interesting about this slide, if you look down in the, and I don't know if I have a mouse here, I do. Yeah. Um, this, uh, this is the drawing of the meter. And what he did was he put a little plating tank in here with copper and they would put a strip in and uh, at the end of the month or the period, they would take that strip out, take it back to the lab and measure how much copper had been transferred uh, onto that strip or off of that strip. And um, that was how they build was the transfer of copper. Uh, you can imagine this was fairly tedious and probably not very accurate. Uh, watt hour meters, a little more like we, we know them today, uh, is 1889 uh, was the next version, and that was from Ferranti. And um, now they start to look a little bit like our watt hour meters that we know today. So the, uh, so the first evolutionary period for the metering was actually from the uh, 1880s to 1934, before there was any significant change uh, in the actual uh, concept and design of meters. Uh, I won't go through all of these, uh, these details, but the, um, some of the things that were uh, added were the uh, remote control switches. Uh, you could have multiple tariff meters, uh, prepayment meters, and um, all of that was done by the turn of the century, so 1900. Uh, the first ripple control system was patented in 1899. And uh, we don't, I don't know of anywhere in the United States that we use ripple control anymore, but it's, it's still used in some countries. For example, Japan still uses ripple control. Hmm. Uh, and now you can see the, uh, some of the big names that we know today uh, involved in it, you know, Landis and Gear, uh, <clears throat> some of those that we see uh, active in it. Um, so the 70s then would, uh, was what I call a revolution in the metering business because uh, in the 70s, we started getting the electronics technology uh, entering the metering world. So we got away from the electromechanical into the electronics technology. And um, that was brought on and accelerated by the invention of the integrated circuit. Uh, so. Just a small aside, my early career was involved in working for a company that made uh, transistor testers. And uh, we thought it was a big deal when we saw the first integrated circuit uh, and had to test it. Um, so if you look at uh, some of the things then that started coming up with um, uh, metering, uh, you usually think of power consumption limitations uh, in a closed meter box and they expected reliability. So they had to do a lot of work to improve the reliability of the electronic meters because they uh, were subject to uh, damage from lightning and things like that. Uh, but with the, with the advent then of the semicon of these integrated circuits, uh, we then could put computers in the meters. And of course, that's what you've seen happening since the, um, since the 1980s. So it's sort of interesting that there, there were hybrid meters which were combining the electromechanical, the, the turning dial that we all remember, uh, to all electronics. They built some hybrids uh, for about 10 years where you had a uh, induction motor doing the, the collection of the data and then the electronic tariff units were added as electronics modules. So. Here, another one that I found very interesting is remote metering. Um, the idea of remote metering was actually born in 1960s, okay? And initially was remote uh, pulse transmission was used. This was gradually replaced by various protocols and uh, communications media, uh, some of which is still around in terms of uh, communicating over the uh, power line or what we call power line carriers. Uh, today, the meters, of course, are very complex functionally and are based on the latest electronic technology uh, to the point where at, at least the, the uh, single phase meters are pretty much a one chip meter at this point. And of course, 
because it's computer technology, you can change the function of the meter by installing new firmware. So uh, one of the little bit about standards, um, one of the things with revenue metering is uh, early on, there were standards because you were dealing with money. And uh, of course, anytime you're dealing with money, there is a, uh, a possibility of fraud. So I was surprised to see that uh, the, uh, some of the early standards, the, the ANSI standard, for example, came out in 1910. So that, that standard has been around a long time. The, uh, the first uh, metering standard, uh, which had publication 43 on it, dates from 1931. Okay. We also found leaflets uh, from as early as 1914 that featured meters with an accuracy of 1.5% which I thought was amazing because if you looked at the technology at the time, seeing 1.5%, uh, there hasn't been that dramatic a change in accuracy uh, over the years. We still have a lot of class two meters or, or class one. And um, so it, it's pretty interesting uh, to see that uh, that accuracy has not really improved that dramatically. I thought we ought to have a little humor break uh, so in, during my research, uh, I, uh, utility that I work with in Asia uh, was one of the pioneers in power quality. Uh, they installed probably the second power quality monitoring system. But um, I found this on their website, and it's a, a, a part of their marketing tools. And so uh, you can see the, uh, it says power quality, and then the, te the text might be too small, but basically they're talking about sine wave, voltage waveforms, uh, distortion. Uh, and then they put this beautiful picture of this meter up here. And I started laughing when I saw this because, you know, first off, they're talking about uh, power quality. And that's, of course, not even a true RMS meter. The second thing is, if you look carefully at the, the test leads, they put the probes into the socket of the meters instead of the banana jacks, which are on the other end of the, of the probes. And of course, nothing is connected, but there's still a reading on the meter. So I, it might be a fake picture. What do you think? <laughs> so in other words, uh, Jared, remember marketing should know what it is they're posting on, on their company website. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So um, power quality meters. Well, the... Uh, the history of power quality meters doesn't go back nearly as far as revenue metering. Uh, the first power quality meter uh, was developed by a man named Abe Dranitz uh, in um, New Jersey, and uh, his company, Dranitz uh, Inc., is still in existence today. Uh, uh, they, I work with them quite a bit in Asia. And uh, it was founded in 1962, and they developed the first uh, Granite 606 uh, meter uh, at the request of some of the computer companies who were having uh, power quality issues. They didn't call it power quality in those days, but power issues in, in computers. Um, the, uh, anyway, the uh, picture there on the right, you can see it was a... Uh, a box meter with a printout, a tape printout or paper printout. And uh, you set the limits uh, for voltage uh, to change on those uh, screwdriver inserts in the top there. The challenge for that meter was how do you get the settings to the point where it doesn't empty the paper before you leave the building? <laughs> um, so they, they, so if you think 1960s today, uh, you know, they're an 80 year old company roughly. Um, and they're still making power quality meters, and we'll see some of those uh, later when we look at some of the history of, of the meters. But they've all been evolutionary. Uh, with that, up to a point in time, they were all evolutionary. Uh, added more features, uh, but they didn't really change the technology very much. The first power quality meter with graphics uh, was developed by a company in California, of course, Silicon Valley, uh, in the early to late 70s. And uh, it was the first power quality meter with a floppy disk. And uh, I have one sitting here we'll look at. Uh, but it also had graphics. So for the first time, you could actually see the waveforms. You could see graphs of the voltage. Uh, but more importantly, you could, you could see transients. 
and that was a major breakthrough. And um, part of the history of this is that uh, Dranich and uh, BMI merged uh, in the late 90s and uh, just in time for the Y2K problem. So probably many of you remember Y2K. Uh, I certainly remember it. Uh, I, I believe that we were going to have major issues with the electrical system uh, at that point in time. So I actually bought a travel trailer, stocked it with uh, gas for everything, uh, and of course, waited around for midnight on uh, Y2K and absolutely nothing happened. Uh, that uh, was an interesting lesson in being prepared, but didn't need it. So. Uh, same issue there. They're, uh, the follow-on products they made were very evolutionary. They all used paper uh, output, and uh, in their case, they did uh, floppy disk, so you could store it on a floppy disk, but um, nothing really uh, revolutionary. Uh, part of my history in the industry is uh, I was one of the founders of a company called Reliable Power Meters, uh, again in Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, we we had a revolutionary change. We had uh, engineers from Silicon Valley doing the, the design and myself and other uh, practitioners uh, providing the input for what was needed. And we developed the instrument that you see there, which has uh, no paper, no screen, uh, no dials, and no on off switch. So uh, it was all digital. There was a very first meter that uh, did the analog to digital conversion right at the input connectors. And um, everything internal in that instrument is digital. So it used the latest, greatest state-of-the-art microprocessor, uh, an Intel 8080. So uh, the, uh, it had a hard disk, the massive size hard disk, 90 megabytes of storage. <laughs> Uh, it was networked. If you look carefully at that, you can see in the lower lower right hand corner here, uh, there's an Ethernet port. So um, we actually were the first meter you could connect on a network and talk to it remotely via the Ethernet. Uh, you see, then we moved up to the Intel 386, 387 software uh, or firmware or hardware, I should say, and then later on we moved to the 486. So. Uh, it was all digital, 128 samples per cycle, which of course uh, gave us something in the order of 200 microsecond resolution uh, on the waveform. Uh, it was database. So now when you got the data, it came out in a database as opposed to a, a, a series of numbers uh, in uh, ASCII characters. Uh, we did uh, something that people still uh, like today and it's called automatic setup. Literally, you plugged it in and you only told it how long you wanted to monitor. Uh, and uh, it took care of setting up everything else, or what the circuit configuration was and uh, how long you wanted to monitor. Uh, extremely rugged case. I was looking for the picture we used in the advertising, but I, I couldn't find it uh, when I was looking for it. That case is saw it was a extruded from an aluminum block, okay? Uh, and so we have a picture with a, a, a uh, Jeep parked on, on top of it uh, <laughs> in, in the snow in, uh, in the high Sierras. Nice. So um, it was very rugged. It was water uh, resistant. It wasn't waterproof. We did make a, um, a version that was waterproof, but uh, it wasn't very popular because uh, putting it outside uh, was too attractive for people to uh, pick up and carry off. Hey, Terry. Uh, yes. I'm going to interrupt you for one second. I got a question from Howard. He wants to know what weighed more in the RPM meter, the hard drive or the battery? Oh, the battery. Yeah. <laughs> the, the battery, the hard drive was actually some of the first uh, hard drives that were used in notebook computers. So it was the same, same hard drive you can buy today. In fact, I buy them when I fix them. So. But the battery was a NICAD battery, and it would uh, support the product for five minutes, but you could have successive outages. So you could run, uh, you know, if you had outages that were occurring repeatedly, you wouldn't kill the battery on the first one. But that was a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
the basic technology that you see today, and those of you who have, have looked at power quality, is the, the uh, IEC 61004-30 is the standard. And if you look at that standard carefully, you'll find out that's what we use. We use that definitions in the meter long before the standard was, was published. So uh, it makes it uh, still usable. And uh, I, we, we have the only repair shop in the world uh, available for those meters if you happen to have one. We still fix them here in Yuma, Arizona. Hmm. Of course, I, I bought up all the surplus uh, and the manufacturing tools and the uh, uh, ones that were available on eBay. I just saw one advertised, by the way, on Amazon, which I was shocked to see. Huh. But we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't skip software because the hardware certainly is interesting and the technology changes have been dramatic. But uh, really, the software has too. Uh, so the software used by Dranitz uh, was developed in the mid 1980s, actually, by one of their distributors. And um, it was the first software that could take the data from the floppy disk and actually generate reports from it. Um, uh, the RPM meter, we developed our own software and it had an automatic report writer in it uh, at the time that we developed it. But also involved was the uh, a company called Electrotech, which is uh, in your neck of the woods down there. Um, and uh, they developed a uh, software for a uh, project for EPRI uh, in the mid 90s. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that project, but uh, it, uh, it has been under constant development since that time and uh, is widely used now by major uh, utilities worldwide. Um, and the key is that not only does it handle all of the power quality parameters and standards, but it also can handle all the energy parameters. So you can use your instruments both to generate energy reports as well as power quality reports. So that study that we, I mentioned there, the EPRI study was 93 to 95. That was the first national power quality study. And uh, the, uh, the interesting thing is it was funded by uh, EPRI. Uh, the contract was awarded to Electrotech to provide the actual engineering and the, the work. They installed 277 monitors located uh, around uh, the United States on primary distribution feeders. There were 24 electric utilities involved. So some of the people on uh, this uh, video may, uh, may remember it. Um, it was commonly known as the Distribution System Power Quality Monitoring Project, or, or DPQ, and uh, it spanned actually the period from June of 93 to September 95. But it was interesting because uh, that data, they developed the, 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 the instrument was developed by Basic Measuring Instruments, or BMI, and um, so it was more that would be considered more revolutionary because they could actually remotely access the instrument by modem. So all of this data was collected via modem. And of course, modem in those days was probably 9,600 baht or some interesting rate like that. Um, they collected over 6.8 billion samples uh, from PQ node was the name of that instrument. And uh, they stored those, uh, the sample stored today in a 46 gigabyte database. You can still look at that data if you'd like. Okay. It, the final report focused on statistics related to RMS variations, SAGs, and eruptions. There were some uh, transient over voltages, some voltage imbalance, but uh, that they preserved that database uh, for history. So one of the, the debates around that uh, I seem to uh, generate sometimes is, uh, is it power quality or is it power, or the quality of supply? So I did a differentiation so people could uh, use the right term. So quality of supply is the quality of the voltage supply delivered to the consumer, usually measured at the point of common coupling, but it could be any mutually agreeable point. Uh, and uh, so it's really voltage quality. Uh, power quality is the quality of all electrical conditions at the actual loads, 
Notice I didn't say electrical parameters, I said conditions. So it includes all the electrical parameters, but it also includes grounding, RF noise, EMI, uh, air conditioning, you know, everything that's impacting the uh, equipment that is uh, working in the factory or in your living room or wherever you have it uh, is we consider a power quality uh, situation. My specialty, by the way, in my uh, my favorite work is grounding issues because they're they're so simple and yet they're so misunderstood. So I know Jarrett plays a little golf or used to, you know, uh, grounding issues are kind of like golf. It's a very simple game. You pick up a club, you hit a little ball, you count the number of times you hit it before it goes in the hole. It's a very simple game, but it sure isn't easy. <laughs> so uh, just to uh, differentiate a little bit between quality of supply and power quality. So quality of supply is for the utility or the provider and power quality is for the consumer. Uh, the uh, parameters, electrical parameters from the utility, uh, voltage of course, and availability of current because while they don't generate the current or while they don't regulate the current, they do have a limit on how much current you can pull out of any specific location. Uh, they have the challenge of being available seven by 24 every day of the year. Then they have issues like st stability of the voltage, reliability. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a, a, a common theme about the number of nines of reliability you know, uh, measured uh, all the way down to uh, seconds or below. And uh, we did a study that the reliability of the telephone system in the early 2000s, which were or landlines, was something in the order of uh, uh, four nines, or six, I'm sorry, six nines, 99.9999%. The reliability of uh, most electric utilities was somewhere in the four nines area. So the reliability uh, was not very, very good. What the customers wanted, the big customers like Intel, they would like to have nine nines of reliability. Of course, you can't get there from here. Wow. Well, the utility also has to worry about voltage distortion uh, to the current IEEE standard, uh, phase imbalance, uh, flicker, uh, which is the only people parameter in power quality. That's, if you've ever been in a room where the lights flicker and get a headache, uh, that's, that's what that's all about. And the utility also has responsibility to limit the magnitude and duration of voltage sags, which would be a dip or, or a uh, reduction in the voltage and the duration of voltage sags and uh, surges. Surges being high voltage and sags being low voltage. The, uh, the other issue they got to deal with is to maintain the distribution network uh, for renewable generation. And uh, when we talked a little bit about uh, what's coming in the future, that is probably most utilities number one headache today is how do they maintain the distribution network for renewable generation, uh, which is a, a major, major change for the industry. From the consumer perspective, uh, while they have the internal distribution network, and there's all kinds of interesting pictures about that, uh, grounding or earthing, if you happen to be from uh, the uh, UK version of, of uh, this, transient protection, uh, they have to protect their equipment from uh, transients generated by utility switching, but also lightning is the uh, number one cause or number one power quality uh, generator, if we want to call it that, um, because not only does it generate transients, but it also generates voltage sags. The uh, harmonic generation, uh, as we know, when the power leaves the generator, in general, it's a sine wave, but uh, it, the harmonics are generated by the loads. So uh, that is a, a consumer responsibility, not the utility responsibility, but they have to uh, figure out how to limit it. Flicker generation, normally flicker is generated by steel mills, but there are other sources like motor starts. And uh, equipment sensitivity, uh, you know, the 
SAGs and surges and transients are normal operation of an electric utility. They cannot stop those because that's protection of the system. And uh, so the, the consumer has to account for that by the equipment that he purchases or by things like you, you now know today as UPSs or battery backups. Uh, the, uh, the other issue is internal voltage tap settings. So almost all of the uh, large facilities have their own step down transformers and they're responsible for the voltage tap settings. One of my more interesting case studies uh, is a, a uh, data center that uh, was built uh, specifically in uh, a building, a 200,000 square foot building for offices and data center. And uh, they, uh, when they built it, they made an error in the electrical, uh, expected electrical voltage. And they end up having to change all the taps on the transformers to the highest level, and it still wasn't high enough. Mm. So that was a pretty expensive change when it when it came down to changing the incoming voltage. Uh, just a, a little review of the parameters uh, for quality of supply. So they've got voltage, current, power. So these are parameters measured uh, by the utilities typically in the substation uh, at a substation bus or sometimes the substation feeders. So voltage, current, power, power factor, phase angles, fast voltage transients, voltage sags and surges, all harmonics, which today uh, the, the uh, typical is the, the 50th, uh, although most instruments today can measure up to the 125th or, or higher. Uh, neutral current, uh, ground current, uh, not so much for uh, the consumer side, but uh, because they don't provide ground to the consumers, but for their internal workings in the substation, uh, they monitor ground uh, for a fault, which returns through ground, so they can measure that current and, and uh, detect exactly when it happened. Uh, flicker, again, real-time network, user selectable limits, uh, RVC is a new term, it's only been around a couple of years, is rapid voltage change, and it's a, uh, a different version of a SAG, and then uh, unbalance or imbalance. Uh, as, the, as the IEC standard requires, all measurements must be gapless, which means you continuously digitize the waveform. And uh, today, the state of the art is probably 1024 samples per cycle, but it generates too much data. So the standard used is either 256 or 512 samples per cycle. You remember the RPM, we did 128 samples per cycle. So 256 uh, times four and then uh, 512. So that's a lot of data being generated and that's 16 bit A to D. So. Uh, smart meters, so this is where we compare uh, the quality of supply to the revenue smart meters. So voltage, current, power, power factor, K, K, KW hours, KVA hours, TOD, um, some of the harmonics, some unbalanced. The big difference is there's no requirement for it to be gapless. In other words, it can be sampled. Um, so one of the big driving forces uh, is a uh, revolution created by the smart grid. And uh, that government, uh, the government uh, funded most of that, not only in the US, but in China and some of the other big countries. Uh, and the more control over the grid is to respond to the unexpected faults. So the, the, the whole foundation of smart grid is to give better control over the grid to respond to unexpected uh, events and faults. More communication from all levels of the distribution uh, system back to the utility control room. And then of course, more data to means more intelligent meters. So the, uh, the smarter meter, or as I call it for the smart grid, it is to extend the grid state uh, to a new architectural uh, definition of the modern grid which is edge of the grid. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, and uh, probably the uh, uh, 
I'm going to move along a little faster here because I think we're spreading short on time. Are we doing on time, Jerry? We got about 16 minutes. Okay. Um, so the smart meters of, of two, 2009 uh, are were the core element of advanced meter infrastructure, which is the latest buzzword uh, in in the industry uh, to do a much higher level of integration from the uh, well, revenue meters and the power quality meters into the infrastructure. So now you, the new meters will, are in 2009 had uh, they're measuring cut consumer or customer electric consumption in different periods. It used to be you know 15 minute or 30 minute. Now it's uh, you can get down lower. Uh, measuring the actual voltage levels in a in a revenue meter. Monitoring the on off status of the electrical service so the utility can. Uh, be aware of uh, the losses. Uh, now, the utility issue is uh, how do they know that you don't have any power at your house? Okay. So, in, in the older systems, they had no way of knowing. The only way they knew you didn't have any power is if you called them. Okay. Uh, communicate these readings to utilities for processing analysis. And then the utility processes the data and makes a lot of it available back to the customer for how much uh, their billing is, how they used it, what the time bases were, and so on. So uh, there's another term for this, and we call this edge of the grid. And that edge of the grid was pioneered by EPRI uh, to move the, the knowledge base of power quality from the substation distribution feeders uh, in the substation to the, the end of the feeder. And end of the feeder is not as simple because uh, the, the feeders are not all just a one long line. Okay, there's many branches and different configurations. And the challenge has been when we, uh, I talked a little bit about renewable generation being the challenge is uh, when people want to put in a uh, photovoltaic system on, on the roof of their factory or in your backyard and you're going to uh, connect it to the, the utility, uh, you're going to connect to the distribution system, not to the uh, transmission system. So prior to this, all power was generated uh, in power plants and was transferred to the transmission system and the transmission system to the distribution system and the distribution system to the customer. Now the customer is going to be doing generation and feeding it back into the system uh, in what we would call reverse power flow. And of course, that's a big challenge for the utilities uh, for all kinds of reasons, but uh, um, they have to still maintain the voltage on all that same feeder. Okay, so uh, that's been a big drive for getting information on what's happening at the end of the feeder or next to the solar farm. And, and what it is named now just for buzzwords is DER or distributed generation. Um, interesting, uh, in Thailand, uh, we were pioneering in the fact that the utility, with a little help from us, uh, has now a regulation that requires any new solar farm that generates more than 100 kilowatts to have a power quality meter uh, attached to the output that the utility can access. So they, uh, they now have uh, moved this forward to what we call edge of the grid meters or sensors. And here's what's going to be in them. Local monitoring intelligence to improve the resilience of the local distribution. Incipient fault detection and local analysis. And artificial intelligence to manage the local DER and critical infrastructure independence. So if you're looking for what's going to happen with uh, revenue metering, uh, revenue metering is going to migrate, in my opinion, to the edge of the grid sensors. And this is a, a nice uh, graphic that I didn't do, uh, but it gives you some feel for uh, the bigger picture of, of uh, ed edge of the grid sensing technologies and data analytics. Uh, so here you see the power resilience, you see the in incipient fault and fault detection. Incipient means it's a little tiny fault that occurs quickly, may or may not cause a disturbance, but it eventually we will migrate to a, a major fault. 
uh, detecting and forecasting uh, DER, monitoring for critical infrastructure's interdependence. So uh, you might want to say that Texas could use a little of that right now uh, because they had uh, critical infrastructure independencies that didn't necessarily work all that well with snow, sleet, ice, and wind. Okay, so uh, today distinct instrument markets are have limited crossover. In other words, revenue metering is a separate business from power quality metering and separate market. Uh, and, um, you know, revenue metering uh, is seeing a lot of changes, but it, it's all about the revenue. And, and as we're seeing some of the changes now, some power quality. Power quality is based on two different ones, portables and uh, quality of supply or fixed systems. So fault detection, automatic fault location, um, and then involving artificial intelligence, we're now seeing automatic characterization of, fault, characterization of faults and prediction of future failures. So what's coming next? Um, Revenue metering with PQ functions and outage reporting, real-time assistance with fault location. If you had a, uh, every uh, residence had a revenue meter that could uh, send a message to the utility, uh, when a fault occurred, they would know very quickly where the fault was located. Um, the power quality metering, not so much, but quality of supply metering can now give the utility very quickly uh, fault location uh, identification. Uh, if they start integrating more uh, artificial intelligence, it will predict failures before they happen. Uh, that's because of this incipient fault issue. The software to manage all this data and provide automatic analysis of faults for planning improvements. So uh, this is interesting because that data is very valuable. And I'm always surprised by the utilities that have large scale power quality monitoring systems are not doing more data mining of that um, data. For example, uh, cable underground cables, you know, have a limited lifetime. So if you monitored and found out that your underground cables were failing, you could then plan to replace them on a timely schedule. And in fact, that is being done by some utilities. So, uh, Interesting thing about uh, the technology or what I'm going to call a revolutionary technology is uh, moving to DC systems. So why, why DC? Well, DC uh, is uh, two wires instead of three. Okay, so it's much cheaper to build. Um, and um, it, it's also very interesting that it's moving to higher and higher voltage. China, for example, now has installed a one megawatt DC system. Okay. And um, that's for a long distance transfer of, of energy. Uh, and it's much cheaper than doing a three phase uh, high voltage AC system. Optimized delivery, for example, um, power flow control systems act as routers to smartly direct where electricity goes. So if I was switching it, uh, power and I only had to switch two wires, maybe in some cases only one wire, uh, I could have better control over power flow in my network. Okay. And uh, the uh, protect assets. So one of the issues uh, is when there's a major fault, at, particularly at transmission, the, uh, they have the opportunity to create tremendous damage if they can't, cannot clear the fault quickly enough. And um, now there are today and being used superconductor technologies that are acting as current limiters for surges. They, I believe those, the, uh, the cost of those will decline and they will become more prevalent, particularly in transmission uh, where that is a major cost factor. Uh, there's a little bit of misnomer there in some of the advertising for those. Uh, these uh, superconductor technology switches limit the power uh, if there's a fault. So you can think of them as a fuse that opens, but it doesn't really open. And it happens very quickly with a superconductor. And mm -hmm. so it blocks the power uh, until the fault can be manually cleared uh, with a breaker or a switch. 
So who's going to pay for all this stuff? Hmm. Well, a uh, little basic math here, and uh, I found this interesting. Um, about 6% of the U.S. electricity generators annually lost uh, in transmission and distribution. So quiz question, what do you think is the highest loss in country in the world for uh, losses in transmission and distribution? And uh, number two is, uh, how do you think the U.S. compares to other countries in terms of losses in transmission and distribution? Okay. That 6% in the U.S. grid represents all of the power used in California for one year. And they use a lot of power. Okay. So o over the last decade, uh, the congestion charges, so congestion charges are those where the, uh, the wind farm is built, but they can't get connection into the transmission grid. For example. Um, the uh, Weather-related outages are estimated to cost the U.S. between 25 and $70 billion annually. And we just had a big example of that in uh, Texas. In 2012, Superstorm Aunt Sandy cost $52 billion. So if we could uh, reduce the outages uh, due to weather, we could save a substantial amount of money. If power electronic systems, uh, advanced metering, uh, advanced smart meters, artificial intelligence could alleviate just 1%, just 1% of all of those inefficiencies that would result in a 500 million to a $1 billion of, in benefits a year. In other words, there's a business opportunity there. Mm -hmm. so the answer to the quiz question is, uh, the US and China share uh, the same number. It's about 6% losses in China. The difference is uh, China is getting slightly better every year because the management of the individual utilities in China uh, are given a bonus based on reducing the losses. Uh, this was answered for me once when uh, I kept hearing in China the big problem for power quality was uh, harmonics, uh, where the rest of the world said the big problem for power quality was voltage sags. Well, it turns out, if, uh, the issue was money that the oh. facility general manager that I uh, was speaking with said, Oh, the reason is because I get a big bonus. If I can reduce the uh, losses in my transmission and distribution by uh, one tenth of 1%, I can get a big bonus for that year. So he's motivated to improve the uh, losses or the lack of losses. Hmm. The other, the answer, the other quiz was, uh, what country in the world has the least, uh, has the most losses in transmission and distribution? New Zealand. Okay. And the reason New Zealand has such huge losses is the generation is on the south tip of the South Island. The major load is Auckland, which is on the north tip of the North Island. Plus they have a, uh, I forget how many kilometer undersea cable, which is DC to DC. So they have to, they have to suffer the losses of DC. Okay, so summary, so we can stay on time. The evolution of both PQ and revenue meters continues as new features are added or to existing products. The revolution of new technology occurs about every 10 years driven by changes in the power supplier technologies and demand. The big demand will likely be DC as distribution uh, replaces, a as DC replaces AC distribution. I didn't believe it until I saw it. It's already being tested in China that they would supply your house with DC instead of AC power. So that that explains that Edison was right. DC was better. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I'd like to give some credits and uh, you'll, you'll be able to capture these back. But these are some of the references that I used to, to do the uh, research for the information. A couple of them are very, very good. Um, if you want information on software, uh, pqview.com is an excellent example. Uh, on hardware, dranis.com. Uh, I'd like to recommend everybody go check out our power quality blog because it's not a advertisement for any particular company or industry or uh, vendor. It's a, what I call an industry blog. And we post a new uh, material every day. 
So I've got a 30 some year history of, of collecting information on power mm-hmm. quality and uh, we're gradually migrating that over to the power quality blog. Um, and uh, the, the very, very last one there is very interesting if you want to read about sensor technology that is funded by Smart Grid. So from our friends in Australia, uh, they say we need to plan for a future that looks like this. And I, I was a little bit amused because that really is today, isn't it? I mean, you can do that in your house today. Wow. Thank you. Jared, are you picking it up? Or no. Uh, That'll be John. That would be me again, Terry. And uh, first of all, thanks again. We really appreciate uh, you doing this. It was a, a tremendous amount of information there. Thank you for the references in case somebody wants to go back and look at some of the stuff that you were talking about, dig a little deeper in it. But uh, thank you so much for all of that, uh, not only for what uh, the history, but also just kind of looking at what's probably coming up. And uh, we can't thank you enough for coming on here. And um, obviously with all, the, all those years, you've got a lot, a lot of knowledge there. And thanks for passing along to all of us. So uh, thank you very much. And um, we've got more of these coming. So uh, you saw the schedule there. You can see we've got uh, on this uh, March 9th, it'll be, uh, we'll have some information about metering from, from Schneider and uh, what's coming up and what, what they're doing because uh, the COVID and stuff. And then we're going to go into a Durham company and then we're going to take the spring break. And then we'll pick back up uh, with more of these. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. A lot of great information there. And um, just as we always say, God bless and be careful out there. And again, uh, thanks a lot, Terry. Appreciate it.